My name is Dr. Daku Telma Olatishi. Um, I'm a health system strategist and a public health physician. And um, I started a foundation, it's still quite young, but it's something I'm quite passionate about because my goal in life has always been to be impactful, to help other people. And having worked in a kidney center for more than five years, I realized that there is a need a serious need and honestly you're talking to somebody today and the next day you call and they tell you oh the person died in the night and you're like but well, i just spoke to this person today and he now tells you that this disease is something that is unpredictable so because of all these things so many things so many things in mind i just said okay it's time to take a step. So having said that, I started what is called the Kidney Care Access Initiative. And Kidney Care Access Initiative, just as the name says, is a foundation that invests in kidney care. So we try to look for patients that actually don't have the means to support their treatment and help them out. It may be a baby step. I may not achieve much, but at least start, and you have faith that it can take you somewhere, you can actually touch people's lives, just as HIV, malaria, diarrheal disease, cancer, they all have a voice. Kidney disease does not have a voice. It's a disease that is a respecter of no man, and the sad part of it is that the, one of the major causes is hypertension and diabetes and it's on the rise in our society. So I wanted to give this disease a voice. It is one of the most expensive diseases in the world. It's not just about Nigeria. We already have a myriad of problems as Nigerians. But I can tell you that when there is health, there is wealth. And so we need to put our acts together and focus on things that are actually very important. And I think kidney disease is a disease that we should begin to pay more attention to. I'm not saying every other disease is not important, but because of the nature of this disease and how expensive it is, we should begin to pay more attention to this disease. So I just, this, this thing has been running through my mind and I'm like, it's time for somebody to come out and give this disease a voice. Maybe somebody out there would listen. You know, people will now begin to pull funds and see how they can help people. Because people are dying every day. And if they're not dying, it's affecting their families, you know? Because it's not a disease that you just suffer and it has a span when it ends. It's something that keeps going and you're spending money. It's, it's pathetic. So because of that, I felt it's time to give this a voice. And not just a voice. Let people know the different facets of what people go through and possible solutions to this problem. The causes of kidney diseases actually run along a spectrum. Uh, so you have those kidney diseases that people are born with, uh, which you call congenital. So at one end of the spectrum, you have uh, diseases that people are born with, you know, inherently, and those manifest in early life and childhood. And then at the far spectrum, you have some other ones that are related to aging. For instance, in the case of men, peculiarly obstructive uropathy, which occurs due to enlargement of the prostate. You know, at those extremes of life as well, you find cases of you know, 
cancer-related kidney problems uh, occurring more frequently. Um, but in between, you have a mix of diseases caused by glomerulonephritis, which as we call that uh, kidney diseases that are related to other systemic diseases like diabetes, like high blood pressure, as well as kidney diseases that are related to other uh, autoimmune conditions like lupus and so on and so forth. It's not necessarily the problems of not having enough doctors or nurses. The problem seems to be from the fact that we as Africans or Nigerians to be specific do not actually do just come routinely to the hospital to get screened. Just the basic test of like a urinalysis or a blood test or your BP check. Those basic things can actually, you know, help us detect those diseases early and then, you know, um, cut down on the rise. But as long as that early detection is not there, definitely the rise will be. Because before someone presents to the hospital, the most times in our environment, the disease progression would have gone so far. To a large extent, kidney disease can be prevented in some instances. Um, what do I mean? If you're looking at people who have uh, chronic diseases, for instance, diabetes and uh, high blood pressure, if you control those conditions well and optimally, you significantly reduce or eliminate the chances of they developing kidney disease as a consequence of these conditions. So to that extent, you can say kidney disease can be prevented. Again, if you look at kidney diseases that result from ingestion of chemicals or drugs uh, indiscriminately or abuse of various substances, those kind of kidney diseases are also eminently preventable. You have like five stages of a kidney um, of the kidney disease, and by the time most people present, they would have almost gotten to a stage three, four, and so most of the kidney mass would have actually been destroyed. So you have you have the person coming at a stage where there's little or nothing you can do to actually prevent it. So you're now talking about cure this time. However, there are certain types of kidney diseases that no one really can prevent in terms of particularly the broad group of glomerulonephritis and those result from inflammation. Uh, in which case there's a failure of self-recognition by the body and the body tends to mount an attack against its own self, destroy the kidneys. Um, in such an instance, preventing it is a lot more tricky. Uh, in such cases, what you want to do is early detection and actually uh, slowing down the rate of progression of this, of this problem. Uh, kidney disease is not contagious. Uh, so, in other words, if one interacts closely with someone who has kidney disease, uh, that by no means will lead to um, acquiring the disease. Uh, I've said earlier that some forms run in families. If you look at autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease, you can find a cluster of people within a certain family who have kidney disease, not because it's contagious, but because they have inherited the same genes that are responsible for that problem. Um, and to answer the second question, most cases of kidney disease usually go unrecognized until very late stages. And I've, heard, I've seen people come to meet me and ask me, um, is it one of my kidney that is spoiled or destroyed or is it two? I'm like, for it to even get here in the first place, to even require dialysis, that means both of your kidneys are bad. Majority of the people you see people walking around, they might just be walking around with one functioning kidney. The second kidney is probably destroyed from one infective process or the other or something else. And most people walk around with one kidney. Even the donors who come to you know give one kidney to a recipient actually walk around with one kidney and they're doing fine. So you can actually have one kidney doing the, the work. So for you to actually have dialysis as an option means that both kidneys are actually bad.
Um, my name is uh, Chukuka Ikenma Kobe. I am from Inu State, the Data Local Government here. Um, grew up in Western, I grew up in Benin, born in Benin. Okay, um, this is Mrs. Mary, now I was diagnosed in 2009 while I was in studying in the seminary school to be a priest of the Catholic Church. I built homes and did landscape jobs for a living. Um, and one of those trips brought me to Abuja. In 2014, one of the periods while I was working, I started to feel you know, funny feelings. Heartbeats of control, um, headaches, uh, massive intake of water, lots of um, loss of appetite, you know, and then I used to have funny back aches. These things, you know, were there for a period of time. At least I would say for like. I've been noticing for like two to three years. Well, I never took them to be serious. I never looked at it as something I needed to go get checked. Well, it hasn't been easy at first, but you know, with time, you just have to um, get to understand what you have been into and also try to. Um, Bear yeah, whatever pain you, you are going through. Mm -hmm. Life is all about us and down. Right? Uh, at first, at first, I asked why uh, I has been to this. I didn't really understand it because uh, I thought that after transplant, it's just a matter of a transplant and everything is over. But unfortunately, uh, in December 2009, I had a transplant. But unfortunately, I lost it in 2011. So um, I was back again to dialysis. Since then, both um, physically, emotionally, and even financially, I've been trying to battle with everything. I woke up one morning on my way to work. I found out my feet were swollen and then all of a sudden I couldn't climb the staircase. I couldn't climb the stairs going up and coming down was quite an ordeal as in it took its toll on me and I was like why was I so tired? And if a family member said you seem to have legs like a Adobe who is a, a, she's a relative of mine. She's my dad's uh, sister. She has large feet. You were sick. I didn't think I was sick. I just felt something was wrong somewhere. But I could, uh, it, would, you know, it would pass. These two will pass. I mean, of course, not, it didn't have a name. We didn't know what it was. We just felt he's not okay. So probably he's had. I had too much water, I had too much alcohol, I had too much food, I had to be too much of something. So it had to be my fault. And I was so busy trying to, you know, figure out what, yeah, figure out what it was. I did a transplant in Apollo, that was in India. And after the transplant, they tried to uh, do a biopsy, but nothing really was found to cause it. So my blood pressure was high, but they were like thinking whether the BP caused the kidney failure or the kidney failure is causing my BP. So they, they were, there wasn't any specific reason. I was directed to a diagnostic lab and I went ahead and started testing. and. Um, 
course, they spelled out the tests which needed to be done. And that was the first time I knew it had to do something with my internal organs. I mentioned doing a kidney function test and a liver function test. And I skipped a bit. And that was when I felt that thought it was serious, really. So I took it seriously. I did an ultrasound, I did x rays, I did a, um, a lower abdominal scan, they called it then. Um, I did urinalysis, I did you know blood tests and so on. But it was the lab attendant's comment that made me say, oh, okay, I think I have a problem. She said, oh, it's like you have a shrinking kidney. And I'm like, what's that? And she's like, one of the kidneys is smaller than the other one. I'm like, oh, okay. Well, it's been a long journey between them and now. Because um, two weeks after, I came back and it was clear I needed to have dialysis. Actually, I had another one in 2012. And unfortunately, it wasn't successful because um, immediately the body started fighting. With them. So when they check, they found out that the antibody was high. So they immediately had to, uh, the next day, do another surgery to remove the uh, grafted kidney. Up to a time that I was planning for the third one, but due to finance and some other advice from other voters, I couldn't go on with the third one. Since then, so that 2013 till now, I've been on dialysis. Dialysis, uh, like we know, is like a machine that takes over the function, some of the functions of the kidneys. It doesn't take over all, and um, it takes over at least the excretory function and then uh, to some extent fluid regulation. In, uh, so it's a machine that behaves or mimics the kidneys. And what it does is um, it passes, it take, withdraws the blood and passes it through some filters to remove waste and takes it back into the patient. And so that's what dialysis does. So a session of dialysis um, will go from between two hours to four hours, as the case may be, depending on whether the patient is dialysis naive, um, if it's the first time, or and then other factors that will determine how many hours the patient spends on the machine. But two to four hours is usually a session uh, of, uh, of dialysis. For some people in early stage of the disease, they don't have any, uh, they don't present with any symptom or sign. And that's why we say that um, uh, the over disease is just a tip of the iceberg of the covered disease. In other words, if you know, if you know what an iceberg looks like, the top of it are the people who have, who are in end stage and they are the ones we see in the hospital. The covered disease is the iceberg down there that nobody knows. Or nobody sees and so that's how kidney disease is it's just a tip of the iceberg so the early stages of the disease you may not have any symptom so they don't come to the hospital no nothing you know um, but as time goes on we now find them with um, somebody swelling either on the face or the leg you know then um, some will tell you they feel tired easily um, oh and I've noticed that my urine foams when I'm weaning, something like that. And then also, you may find people come down with, uh, by the time they're getting to the hospital, oh, your blood pressure is very high, you know, and then as it progresses, you start having symptoms like um, vomiting, headaches, hiccups, body itching, you know, and then the general malaise. So they, that's that's when you, you, you now begin to know that, yes, there's a, there's a problem with the kidney. So for the early stages of the disease, Patients may have no symptom, and so they don't come to the hospital. But as the disease progresses, then they begin to manifest some of these uh, symptoms and signs that I've talked about. Those are the two uh, methods of treating this disease. The people are looking at stem cell and an artificial kidney. These are the things that the science, the, world, the science world is looking at. But for now, the two reliable ways of treating the disease is where kidney transplant or 
um, dialysis. I walked into the dialysis ward. I've never been to a dialysis ward before. And I saw tubes, blood. I saw lots of people. I saw people looking very gloomy. And I'm like, come on, why is everybody here looking so funny? And I'm like, man, this is not for me. I'm stronger than I'm nothing. You know, and I just walked in and smiled. And I went to the first doctor who had handled me. I said, well, I'm going to pierce you with a needle. I hope you, you don't mind. I'm like, it's okay. I stuck my hand out. You know, like it was, they're going to stick one needle in. And he stopped that one and put it out. Took a blood sample. And you know, I was like, I thought it was over. Then he was like, no, you come and sit down here for a while. Then after a while, you come and lie down on this bed. Yeah, I went. I lay down on the bed. And they checked me in and then they had to stick a needle in between my legs, you know. And then he said, well, I'm going in. And I saw a long needle coming in and I was like, is that entering inside me as in? And then I screamed. Then I was like, okay, it's not that painful. It wasn't painful. The first time it wasn't painful, really. Before you knew it, I spent four or five hours done the session. <clears throat> He said I had to have three. I came back the next day, I had another one, and then on. I think it took me about two weeks having these sessions before I, it occurred to me what I was really going through. Because, you know, one of the sessions, they had to explain to me what exactly was going on and what the machine was doing and what I needed to, you know, deal with and what it was controlling and before you did one paragraph became a page, a page, then it became a whole, you know, chapter and from then on. It's a disease that is a respecter of no man, age-wise, you know, because when you talk to certain patients, they say, oh, I talk kidney disease, it's for the old. Actually, it cuts a cross all ages and gender. I've seen kids that are like um, eight years, ten years, middle-aged people, older women, most commonly these days, younger people because of the implications of um, the habits which we find them indulging these days. So younger people most recently. Well, in the first place, uh, my name is uh, John Edoja Onema. I'm a legal practitioner by profession. And uh, I practice here in Abuja, I'm based here in Abuja. Uh, my son has been having dialysis here for over two years now as a result of uh, kidney issues. And uh, the matter started as far back as 2013. He woke up one morning on the uh, 28th of December 2013, and we saw that his face was puffed up. Uh, we thought that, uh, in fact, his siblings were making jests of him, that he must have taken too much of uh, Christmas rice, you know, on 28th of December, and it was a few days after Christmas. Uh, um, Oboro Loa is my name. I am 36 years old. I have been battling with kidney ailments for the past one year and eight months for now. And that is why I found myself in this Zenith Medical and Kidney Center. And I'm being treated for this ailment. And so far, I've had some improvement and then I've been transplanted. After the work resumed, actually, when they checked his BP, it was 230 over 180. In fact, the nurse that checked him said uh, since uh, she started work as a nurse, she had not seen a child of that age having uh, that kind of uh, blood pressure. By the way, my son, as at that time, was 13 years, but he's 16 years old now. 
I could say it's, uh, this is the greatest challenge I've, I've had in my entire life. By the grace of God, I'm, uh, I'm going to 53 years now. Uh, but I've never had any thing that has challenged my uh, challenged me like this. Never. This is the greatest challenge I've ever had in my in my lifetime. And uh, indeed it has affected me virtually both it has affected both emotionally, even physically. Before this time I have no idea of kidney disease. What I only hear is that people go for kidney transplant. Little do I know about nothing do I know about what it is all about until it dawned on me that I am a victim. Physically it, it has not been very easy with me because I found out that throughout the whole of this period I mentioned my strength in everything, my physical strength has gone away from what it used to be. So I've always been assisted in one or two things. So it has not been very easy for me, physically speaking. And emotionally, I find out that it keeps me mentally unbalanced and always thinking, being worried all the time. Seeing myself that I am no longer a part of the society because most of the things I'm able to do before now, I cannot carry them out. It's not how I can carry out social activity, even in terms of worship, go out to places of worship is very difficult. And even trying to see that we do some of those things you were able to do before now. Academic activity has been cancelled. Well, remember that you are not making progress in any aspect of this life. You get off balance. Of course, there's no. You know, there's not there's nothing like kidney issue in my family. Even from my from my own side and from my wife's side, nobody has had that. Uh, you shall not hurt. At least I grew up to meet my my father, and then my father lived you know, almost hundred years before he died in 1990. He never told me of anything like that. My mother is still alive. There's never been anything like that. From experience, now. I can boldly talk about it uh, very, very, very costly. Very, very, very costly. Because um, I've checked that uh, from the, the dialysis itself, even the drug and all that, very, very costly. Now, the cost of dialysis I've checked ranges between 25 to 30,000 in Nigeria now, between 25 and 30,000. The, depending on the hospital uh, per section. After I've been diagnosed of it, I have been placed on a dialysis. Initially, I happened to be on a two weekly dialysis. It's twice weekly dialysis, which was spanned maybe within Wednesday and Saturday. But after some time, when the sickness seems to be taking a greater dimension, it was increased to three weekly dialysis. But in most cases, it's not just a dialysis. You need, still need to take some inje injection, the erythropoietin, or what is properly properly called the recommend, you know, and all those drugs. And all those drugs are very very costly. Some of them, in fact, presently go as much as uh, between twelve to 15,000 Naira per just injection. You come to the hospital, before you go, you have spent 50,000. That is per section. And by me medically, you are supposed to do uh, uh, sorry, uh, dialysis thrice a week. And so if, you are, if, you, if in a section you spend 50,000, you are doing it thrice, that's about 150,000. It is it's, it's, it's mind-boggling. And that's why it once it has come, it will drain you both financially, mentally, and everything. Not many people can can afford can afford afford it. Spending over hundred thousand naira a week, and it's not as if it's for a particular time. Okay, this is the end of it. 
is until God Himself intervenes or medically there's some solution. So this is this is the which is very very costly, very very demanding in terms of a, a cost. It's tormenting, as you say. It's tormenting. It's not something that one to which is enemy. It's not like. I have a bank account that's spinning with a lot of dollars, yeah. but um, it's been very, it's been difficult. It's been hand to mouth. Every member of my family has had to chip in in one way or another. Many times, the finance is even the major challenge at this time, especially in the situation of the country. You know, when everybody is struggling, for, uh, struggling for. Uh, Financially, first I've come to terms because, like you know, it's been a long battle all along. So um, I've come to terms with my condition. Understand that God made us and His He molds and remotes us. You know? So the emotion, although once in a while, I ask, it pains because the things you normally could do, you cannot do them any longer and. You know, like I told you from when I was studying to be a priest, that dream is like chattered, but like I said, God moves and remodels. us. So, um, I've seen the pains and also see the gains because life is all about tears and joy. So, I'm moving on also praying God to, hoping on God's miracle. Even as I'm still managing myself, I'm still hoping that, yeah, in as much as we don't know how it started, God still have the power to end it in one way or the other. So, that is... Even spiritually, at times you begin to ask yourself, what is it? Because I will say God. I'm only a caretaker of this boy. I'm just only a caretaker. You are the one that brought this boy to life. Can I love you more than you? It's not possible. And we look into the scriptures and all the, all the promises that you are giving us. Why would this one still remain? You know? So, that is even spiritually, I have to even ask God some questions and all that. But who will give you the answer? So, we still believe in God that. Uh, you do it in his own time. So that's it. That's the situation. There's really lack of awareness. People don't know about it. Don't even know. I, I, I'm, I'm, I think one of one one other reason why I wanted to do this documentary is to spread the word and tell people that it can be prevented. I'm more interested in preventive medicine. Because once you have the disease. You had it, you have the disease. There's nothing anybody can do. You either continue dialysis or you decide to do transplant. But I'm an advocate for preventive medicine. So you have to look at your lifestyle. You have to if you your people have history of um, family history of diabetes and hypertension, so you have to now take extra caution as an individual. So the awareness is very key. It just starts with um, I think uh, more often like every year or every six months, but yearly is um, feasible, you know. Um, simple tests like just checking, simple things like just checking your blood pressure, you know, is a very, very important step in checking that your kidneys are fine. And then if you go to the hospital and they do routine tests for you, like some people do annual checkup and all that, they can just check your urine urine, blood pressure, and you know, those are the very basic things that one needs to check. So I'm hoping that one of these days we'll have maybe a kidney disease walk, getting people aware, letting people know there are certain things I cannot do. Like in fact, there's something I've, um, I've come to notice, especially in Nigeria, we take a lot of herbal medications. A lot. And that is one of the causes of kidney disease. I had a man that came in one time, I don't know, he took a concoction of things, he said he wanted to cleanse his body, and he said um, pain, um, there was blood in his pee, you know, and thank God it, um, the, the, the specialist caught the, the damage early, 
he had a, an acute um, kidney shutdown. So he had to do dialysis to actually get out all the toxins that he had took and all that. And you see a lot of people selling these things on the road and people just drink it. There's no so, sort of no regulatory body, nothing. So awareness is important. When people know the things that can cause this disease, they stay away from it. Just the way people have been talking about HIV, wear a condom, abstinence, you know, and stuff like that. It's time for us to take that kind of um, campaign on kidney disease as well so that people will know what to look out for. And the, and the, and the thing about this is that is there's no symptoms. When you begin to show symptoms, your kidney is damaged. A transplant, on the other hand, refers to implanting a kidney from a donor. Everybody's born with two kidneys. Um, one can donate a kidney without any adverse consequences. And someone gets a kidney and it's implanted into the person who has kidney failure and it takes over the function, you know, of the failed kidneys in that individual. Donor availability is a challenge all over the world. Um, it's, it's a very difficult one because um, it takes a lot to get uh, people, donors, to, sh to share kidneys with their loved ones. So this is a challenge and that's why in some parts of the world, cadaveric uh, kidney donation is, uh, is very common you know, because uh, there's scarcity of uh, donor organs. But we live in Africa where to some extent there's still that um, uh, bond between families and so when a member of a family is down with a disease, you still find siblings or parents or children coming up to donate the organ to their loved ones. So that is the main source of uh, uh, donor organ in the country, related kidney donor, living related kidney uh, uh, donors or kidney transplant is what is popular in our environment. To get a donor is one of the biggest challenges in uh, kidney issue. It might have the money you understand, and you don't get a donor, then you have not started anything. Even not just getting a donor, but get the right donor. Get the right donor that suits, that matches at least you in terms of uh, 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 um, blood group, you know, genotype, uh, cross matching, or whatsoever. So, and it takes a, it takes the grace of God to get that. It challenges was great, you know. Having a donor was a bit very difficult. Uh, it's very difficult to uh, tell you one of the truth. The first time is we approached somebody to to donate for us, or for me actually. But when I say for us, because I am with a lot of my, my family members were there. But for me, it was a very difficult thing to do until my younger brother came on the line to rescue the situation. When I was preparing to uh, uh, go for who is to donate or not, and I went to my family first, you know, and um, some of my brothers, I know that you were, the, you, you were tested and they found uh, not uh, fitable because some have some issues, you know, like other diseases and all that. So, and have to, when, just, I went at some my to other of my siblings and uh, by God's grace, I was able to find one, you understand? So, and and I thank God to do that because you can see I am healthy, I'm okay and uh, by the grace of God, I give God all the glory. It was some sacrificial thing he did and I couldn't imagine that he can do. I'm so appreciative. We did not just hear the news, I was part of it. We, we, we stayed, um, we went through different hospitals and the situation was really critical. Sometimes he faints um, on the way or something like that and there are some times that he can't sleep for like three days and all that. Seeing all that and everything that he, he is going through, it's, I don't think it's, it's that too hard a decision to make because definitely you you you're part of the process you you, you feel what he's going through and all that 
so it wasn't really that to this thing but the fear of doing it what happens to my to me what happens to my family will i die and all that what becomes of my new lifestyle and all that it's so understand you're married with kids yeah how were you able to relay such a message it was not this thing in fact i was not given the permission i had to to sneak out to do it actually seriously because my wife was not in support of it at all but later when she, uh, we gave her some kind of education about it we did lots of research even myself she she did lots of research too from the internet and all that and you know that helped in um making us to form our decision and all that so it was not easy at first you know making decision oh you go like that so it was not just that easy so because i have people dependent on me and all that so we did lots of research and all that and later we discovered that you can actually go on to live a normal life and in terms of the donor, the donor can will live a full and normal life. Uh, all the long-term studies, uh, which date back to several decades of studying people who have donated their kidneys, uh, show that there are no uh, worrisome consequences of donating a kidney, uh, by and large. Uh, so the donor can have a normal life. Of course, that doesn't preclude the fact that healthy lifestyle modifications have to be implemented both by the donor and the recipient. For instance, the donor is not expected to gain weight excessively, expected to exercise normally, eat healthily, and do all the usual preventive um, lifestyle adjustments, which everybody, whether they're a donor or not, has to do. We screen, we run a lot of um, tests on them and um, they live a normal life like everyone thereafter for the donors. For the recipient, um, there is a, the, the transplanted kidney has a lifespan, you know, and um, if, if, if it will be around 15 years. If that fails, then they can go and have another transplant done, you know. So that's how, I, how it is. We don't have cadaveric kidney donation or cadaveric program in Nigeria as of now. So what we have is living related uh, uh, kidney donors, whether they are genetically related or, or not, you know, not genetically related. That's what is popular in our environment. I do, I don't have any of this thing. I, I still do what I used to do before donating my kidney. I'm very, very okay. My blood pressure, okay. Um, my blood sugar okay everything just okay the way it was before i was told that it was caused by hypertension that i was hypertensive i never i never knew that you know i used to believe that a, a man is only strong a man don't need to go to hospital whatever and check yourself and you don't take small paracetamol and you know you're okay then continue your work and that was what i was doing then and I never knew that. Instead of checking my, you know, sometimes I feel feverish, uh, temperature, my temperature rise, and I don't care. Just take small parts and relax. And constantly, the BP keep rising. I never knew. Until, you know, went right to a certain state that the kidney cannot control. Then it, it crashes the kidney. And that was what happened then. Happened then. I never knew until I was told. And that was after the kidney had failed. So to compare that, of, like now, I cannot take such step again. One, I cannot take self-medication anymore. In those days, I used to take self-medication. All these I will go to chemists and please mix this thing for me and let me drink. Do you understand? And now, I can't do that. I can't take self-medication. Anything I want to take now must be from the doctor's prescription. You understand? So, and I have to, so at least to manage my life now. So, um, comparing those days and now, I think life now, I, I now, now understand that the life, life now, life is, is not something that I should be taking for granted. Okay, with all the rules and rules, regulations that uh, were given to us, especially me myself, uh, before the transplant, we were, we were educated, we were 
it's a given some form of enlightenment and of how life will be after transplant. You must maintain the rules and regulations. Do all the hygienic things that you're supposed to do. Eat the food that's recommended for you. Then the rate of recovery was so high. And I think that now I can do whatever any normal or how I'm still back to my old self working, you know, and the performance is even higher now. Comparing those days and now, I think life now, I now, now understand that the life now, life is, is not something that should be taken for granted. You understand? Don't take the life, you know, for a ransom, you know, for something you think is just an easy thing. The life is not an easy thing. Any small thing, then you are gone. If you don't check yourself very well, if you don't take care of yourself very well, anything can happen. And when it happens, you face it. Just like one of uh, my lecturers used to say, that you that he owns you sorry, or, or maybe this is sorry, but you own the pain. You understand? So whatever that happens to you, you own the pain. Like what when I was going through all this, I was going through the pain. Even my mom, my my parents, my siblings, they were only telling me sorry, 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 but I was having the pain. So the life should not be taken for granted. <laughs> Can you live with the guilt of seeing your loved one die and live with that guilt forever, knowing that you can actually do something for him to save his life? What is the greater goal? Is it um, when you have a 99% chance of survival? Because actually, before you go for the kidney donation, they must have um, given you a series of tests and all that. You have a 99% chance of survival. Wouldn't you be able to fix that 99 thing that you have the chance of survival to the one percent that something might just really happen. I think it's a worthy cause. And also you feel pleased with yourself and you feel satisfied that you've given something out to save a life. That is the most important goal, actually. Oh. We are very close now, very, very close, seriously. Okay. You know, very, very close. My name is Mwene Christopher. It's my birthday, my 47th birthday today. Yay! Happy birthday! Thank you. <laughs> my name is Mbago. Ezi Ada of Obo, Limo State. I'm a um, retired immigration officer, retired as an acting deputy director of immigration three years ago. So for now, I'm a person and a senior citizen. <laughs> Coping with diabetes. <laughs> what I used to know about kidney challenges, or maybe what I used to think of when I was growing up, was that it was a disease of the rich and the, <laughs> and the elderly. Okay. I never knew somebody in my class or in the lower realm of the society could have kidney challenge. You know? you know, those days we used to hear people flying abroad to go and and the kidney challenges and all that. So we thought it was just those who had money and, you know, the elder, elderly then too. 2012, I was based in Benin then. I was coming to Abuja, you know, for a promotion interview. So along the way, I realized that every 10 minutes, I asked the driver to stop. I wanted to ease myself. I said, but I didn't take so much water. What's this? So by the time from Benin to Abuja, by the time we got to Abuja, we stopped over 15 times. So, and by then, I was feeling weak and tired. So actually, by the time I got to Guagualada, where, uh, where the interview took place, I was so, too tired to sit. So they had to take me to an office to, to lie down. So I managed the interview. You know, even the panel members were sorry. They said, if we had no woman, we would have called him. So from there, I went straight to the hospital. So in the hospital, the doc not this one, my family hospital. 
you know, he said, he said, so the doctor now told me, Madam, you have a diabetes. I said, diabetes? She said, yes. So, and I was due to travel three days after that. I was really shocked when I was diagnosed with kidney challenges. Yeah. And this was diagnosed about two years ago, 2014. Actually, my bank uh, runs every year, there's a health check on all the staff of my, of my place of work. And I did that in 2014. The doctor then, once he first told me, what the doctor told me was that there was sugar in my urine, you know, and I needed to see a specialist so that they can advise me better. Actually, this was discovered in uh, on the chair where I was working in UBA, and then I was referred to the Federal Medical Center in Asaba to be uh, for a follow up with another doctor, a nephrologist specifically. I woke up one morning. I was I was watching the telly. So luckily, my kid sister in whose house I was, you know, she's a medical doctor. Too, so she was with me. So I wanted to say something. I found myself slurring, you know, like oh. She said, "No, no, what is this? What is this?" I said, "No, no, no." He said, "Oh, yeah, yeah." She said, "Hospital, hospital." I said, "No, I'm, I'm fine." He said, "Hospital, hospital." So that's how I found myself in Memorial Hema in Houston. They did all the tests. My sugar, my sugar level was so low. In fact, they gave me a small cup of, I don't know that it was just sugar, with a little orange. I was admitted. I was there for three, four days. They advised me to, you know, to make arrangements for transplant. So I said, no, I better get home. And my sister believes that Nigerian doctors are equal to this, that it's just that they don't have the equipment, you know. So some of our friends came around and said, ah, you can't go, you can't go. My sister said, no, I'm a doctor, but I prefer Nigerian treatment, you know. So, my dear, I found myself on a wheelchair. Before now, actually, I never thought that you could do, you could carry out a clinic transplant in Nigeria. I never knew of it. I never heard of it anyway from anybody. Because all we knew right from when we were growing up was that people went abroad to go and treat such illnesses and... Uh, we didn't have any any uh, hospital that could handle it in Nigeria, and so just for want of second opinion, my cousin went into the you know went through the internet and browsed for any hospital that could handle kidney challenges, you know. And came up with one of the hospitals in Dubai. It was, uh, that was, uh, and there was a urologist there who was consulted and he promised, uh, having seen my checks, my, my results, he thought he could salvage the situation and invited me to come over. So by April, 2015, I went to Dubai. But when I carried out the, the, the test there, my right kidney was having 26% left, and the left was having a life, but 73 left. And uh, but the doctor said he couldn't salvage the situation. Uh, the damage was serious. And actually, what I was diagnosed of initially, initially was hydronephrosis. So. When he saw that, he said he thought it was no point, you know, living out the kidney. So he had to do nephrectomy again. You know, nephrectomy was advised in, in Benin. Again, he advised on nephrectomy. So when I got that, I thought, well, if it was nephrectomy that was the last option, why not? So he went ahead and carried out the nephrectomy. It was okay. It, it went well. And in three days, I was up from the bed, I moved around, so I thought everything was okay. The doctor that told me before that my kidney was giving me told me that it's almost zero, you know. So it was there a nurse 
told me that there's a kidney center. And that's where it's supposed to go. So we checked my weight. It was 168 kg. So we got here about 1 a.m. the night. They brought me here. She said, no, you can't stay here anymore. So they brought me here. That's how I found myself here. So that same early morning, you know, they took the test, series of tests. I was admitted. Then the next day, the MD and the team of doctors came, did their own tests and everything, and, asked, and placed me on dialysis. So anyway, that's how I found myself here. And uh, by God's grace, and because it's very, it's very necessary to say this. I say it everywhere. You know, when you see a good thing, it's good to let people know. You know, when you're not well, it's not just the medicine. The attention and the behavior, the attention of the staff, it goes a long way. I noticed that here. You know, the nurses will come around, whether they're, they're, they're assigned to you or not, they'll come around, they'll ask you how you are, they tell you to be all right. Like, I don't like injections. So when they come, I say, uh, so some of them will put their hand behind their back. I said, no, nurse, let me see your right hand. He said, no, mommy, it's okay. I said, no, it's not okay. Let me see your, you know. So they said, mommy, it's okay. You need it. Don't worry. We want you to be well. Anyway, that's how we moved on. And, you know, when you see somebody cares about you more than you care for yourself. So if I, one of the doctors, doctor, that I said, if you don't cooperate, when it's my turn to take blood from you, I'll take it from your eyes. You know, <laughs> so I started calling him Dr. Uh, what do you call Dr. What the Dracula? You know, so that's the atmosphere. The atmosphere was very nice, very friend, you know, friendly, and it's as if you're in your own house, your family, surrounded by family. So November 7th was one year that I did the surgery. And because of the inner satisfaction and the feeling of well being that I got, you know, and I made up my mind, you know, I said, ah, I'm going to keep this exercise. You know, I found that extra happiness. You now know that when you're doing the right thing, you know, you feel good inside and you're happy. And I went about my job. I came back to Nigeria, I went about my job, working and all that. So, but somehow, sometime in January of 2015, you know, I took EU. I was rushed to the hospital. I didn't know what happened. So apparently, I had gone blank. Sometime around April, I guess, I had another attack. Again, I went back to the hospital and was treated. But around June, it was like, I wasn't just myself somehow. I'm talking about 2015 now. And uh, I was taken to the hospital. And the doctor said, when I gained consciousness, that they needed to put me on dialysis. When I came out, somebody had told my wife while we were in the hospital that there was a doctor. He didn't um, give the doctor's name, but he just gave the doctor's number. And the, the doctor is in Nigeria here, yeah? and she talked to the doctor, but not to let anybody from the hospital know that he had given out this number. <laughs> Eventually found out that the person that referred my wife to India, they have their own courts from the doctors in India, when they refer somebody and all that. So this person that said, don't tell these doctors that, you know, <laughs> that I gave you this number, I called the number, and the doctor picked up and I asked, is this, uh, I want to know who this person is. Somebody gave this number and said, it's a kidney center, and you treat a transplant, you do transplant and all that. And he said, yes, I will do it, we do transplant. I didn't feel convinced because uh, I just didn't believe that we had a center like this in Nigeria. I was, I wasn't convinced. So the next day, we talked on Monday. By Tuesday morning, I was on my way to Abuja. I was in Abuja. I saw Dr. Latishe, who introduced himself. I said, I called you from Benin. And this, I tried to make inquiries, and this is what I've done. And this is what I, what I want to know. So he told me in confidence, he told me that you do it. That, Zenith Medical and Kidney Center carries out transplants every month. I didn't even know about you. That if I had known, maybe I wouldn't have gone to Dubai, you know, as of last year. And I said, well, you're here now. What do we what do? We do? And I told him my own side of the story, everything, all the, all the tests and everything I've carried out, even the ones at Dubai, the results from Dubai and all that. He said that if I had seen, if I had seen him before I went to Dubai, 
and he would have done a better job than Dubai. Like I was wondering, I said, why? How do you mean? So he got told me something about stent, fixing his stent in the kidney to you know to extend the life of the kidney or something. That they do all that here in Nigeria. That for me to have twenty six percent and it was moved, that was an anomaly. That the average cut off point yeah, for bad kidney is ten percent. You cannot salvage less than ten percent. But as for ten percent of you can you can salvage. At that point I was depressed. I said, How so that means Dubai didn't do a very good job, you know, and they didn't that all, you know, apparently they didn't carry out enough tests that I'm doing right now. Like right now, I've done a cystoscopy to find out that the blockade is still there. Okay? And he explained that because the blockade was not removed after that first nephrectomy, it affected the second kidney. And that's why I was having all these challenges. And I felt very disappointed because I thought, you know, they had done a good job over there. And then, it just pissed me off that we could have such knowledge bank in Nigeria, and yet, you know, they're not noticed, and we don't even, even the government doesn't encourage things like this. So when I heard his own side of it, his thoughts about the whole thing, I was really thinking about it, but I said, well, we have to move forward. And so we're working towards the transplant. Hopefully, I should be in the hospital on admission by Thursday. And by Monday, by God's grace, I should have a transplant. Successful one indeed. So that's just so far how we, where we are. Thank <laughs> you.
think there should be a massive and concerted campaign on the part of the government to educate the general public about, you know, this problem. Because it's, it's cheaper for the society as a whole to prevent kidney diseases than to treat them, generally speaking. In this environment, uh, resources, health resources are scarce. You know, um, majority of the um, government in Africa still don't get to the target in terms of recommendation on what chunk of our budget should be dedicated to health, health care. So prevention is the way forward. And the only way government can do this is by via sensitization, getting Nigerians to know that, look, there is a rise you know, of this disease, uh, uh, prevalence of the disease, and um, um, we should all join hands and prevent. You know, various countries now are doing a lot about trying to have um, a population that is not obese, for example, cutting down on smoking and the rest of other risk factors that I've mentioned. If they're able to have a stronger degree of regulation on people who sell illicit medications and so on and so forth, if they're able to also get make sure that those who have chronic diseases have access to the care of those conditions in terms of medications being affordable for hypertension, diabetes and so on and so forth, um, I think it will go a long way in preventing this problem. For those who already have kidney diseases, the government can also do a lot if there's a will, political will, in terms of subsidizing the cost of their care, in terms of even having some incentives to make sure that you know consumables that are used for dialysis patients are, be, are able to be brought into the country you know, at, at cheaper rates. And the middleman effect can be knocked off to some degree. Uh, it will help people to have a better quality of life. We've had this couple of days to talk to different patients, you know, different individuals, both people that are about to donate their kidneys, people that have donated their kidneys. We've spoken to a dad who has been fighting, um, battling with the disease um, for three years. His son was diagnosed when he was 13, now his son is 16. Um, we've seen people on dialysis, we've seen their struggles, we've heard their struggles. We've seen the different faces of the disease and we've seen that these are human beings, these are well to, um, learned Nigerians, these are people that have families, that have friends, that have a job, you know, they are not miscreants, they are not um, homeless people, these are responsible individuals. And so it tells you that this disease does not respect anybody. It tells you that it is time for us to wake up. It's a massive burden. For example, the man that has a son that has CKD, chronic kidney disease, he has told his other son to stay back home while he sources for funds to send him to the university. Now, if that is not a burden, then I don't know what is. Somebody has to give up his um, university education because his younger brother is sick. And his younger, being, his younger brother being sick is not his fault at all. So it tells you that it is not fair that these people should suffer by themselves. And from everything you hear, they depend on their families, they depend on the church, they depend on the little savings they have, you know, they're not so, even if you're a very rich Nigerian, somehow wherever you're packing that money, it will definitely finish. If you're spending that kind of money on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, on your dialysis, on your treatment, even after transplant, you need to buy medications. It tells you that it's time for us as a country to come together and support these people. It's time for us to join our hands and say no, chronic kidney disease cannot keep affecting everyone. You know, let them not feel that they're by themselves because from everything I've heard, 
throughout this documentary is like they're on their own. This disease is a serious problem and it is on the rise. It is on the rise. It is it has no it's not it's not backing down. It is on the rise as long as there's the rise of um, um, hypertension, there's diabetes, there's the rise of obesity, there's the rise of um, um, herbal medications, there's the rise of bleaching, um, 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 using bleaching cream, this disease is going to be on the rise. So it is time for us to come together, work together and see how we can help these people. Now the Kidney Care Access Initiative is something I sat one day and I told myself, I have, I have worked in a kidney center over five years and I have seen what these patients go through in terms of finances. You know, in terms of somebody, you call somebody, you've not seen the person in two weeks for dialysis, you call the person. The person is breathless at home but he or she cannot come to the hospital because they don't have money for dialysis. So Kidney Care Access Initiative is a foundation that invests in kidney care. So we look at patients that do not, cannot afford their treatments, their kidney care treatments, and we tailor those funds to those patients. We're hoping to get an international attention concerning this. We're hoping that the government will come with some sort of package, you know, to help these patients. We're hoping that the health maintenance organizations will also come with some sort of package to help patients on that is a lifetime thing. There's no stopping about dialysis. It's a lifetime thing. And even if you do kidney transplant, you need drugs to keep that kidney so that you don't, uh, your body does not reject that kidney. But we need to get the word out there that this is real so that you do not fall into that category where you now begin to ask me for help. How long do you want to ask for help? After a while, people will give up because they also have their own life to deal. They also have their own expenses, their own bills to pay. So I am hoping that this would open our eyes so that we channel our money better. A society that is healthy is definitely wealthy. Thank you. As regards this documentary, I appreciate it when she told me, I said, it would be my pleasure to talk about diabetes, you know, because ignorance, you know, has done a lot of damage to our society. You can imagine somebody like me saying, if I could be unaware, so you can imagine down the line, the rural areas, you know, the damage is doing. So this is a very, very good thing. It's a very, very good idea in the right direction. And I'm, I'm quite happy to be associated with this uh, project. The most of the bad times, and there are lots of times I've been depressed, wake up in the morning and really can't carry on. Yeah, sometimes I wake up in the morning and I cry. But you have to keep on. You have to keep on. To fight an illness, you have to be strong. You have to be strong, strong, strong. Right from the depths of your stomach, the pits of your stomach. You have to really be strong. I believe that if by the grace of God, God Himself revealed this knowledge to the doctors, you know, to the medical profession, this yes, will be over one day. But until that is done, you do go for dialysis, you go for kidney transplant, alternatively, you only uh, put your faith in God. Outside that, there's no other, there's no other, other thing. Yeah, my expectations are not far from what is common to those who have undergone transplant. I will not expect something beyond what they have also experienced. What I mean is to experience a, a quality life after the transplant. And that the doctors, the surgeons, and all the nurses who are involved Will give me the best so that after the transplant I can still come out and then mix up with people and then carry out my normal activities the way I used to. We 
they have some kind of people that think that it's a spiritual problem or somebody's out there doing you. No, each and every one of us, most people have one health challenge or the other. As far as we are praying, we should, God also say that He helps those who help themselves. We should try also best to um, manage ourselves, do the ones we can do, and part of it is also uh, doing the dialysis as we wait on the miracle of God. I know God will always see us through. Like I am taking a drop of about 240,000 naira monthly. 240,000 naira monthly. How do I get that? I know that I'm not working. How do I get it? And that is why the government has to provide a medium to support uh, people that are down with these diseases and even support those that are uh, that had their transplant, like somebody like me, hey, come and come and help us. So, and I pray that um, it shall be well. I feel strong, I feel energetic, you know. So, I really, uh, I really appreciate the doctors, all the other that they did, you know. Oh, you know, bringing me back to my, my normal self. So it's really good. I feel really good. And I can't wait to go home. <laughs> <laughs>